Hello everyone and welcome to a video that I'm very, very excited about. It's been right about three weeks on the nose since the 2022 candidates tournament finished. Yana Pomnishi, as most of you probably know, won in absolutely crushing fashion. He secured tournament victory with a round to spare. And uh, the winner of the candidates, of course, gets the right to challenge uh, the world champion in the next world championship match, which Jan has already done. Now, the candidates has been entirely overshadowed by shocking news, or maybe not so shocking news, depending on where you stood, that Magnus Carlsen has renounced uh, his willingness to defend his world championship title, which means that Jan will be facing off against Ding Li Ren, the second place finisher in the candidates tournament in the next world championship match. But my biggest pet peeve is that when these news come out and when a tournament like the candidates finishes, there's often uh, a, you know, a couple of days where you see immediate reactions and you see people going crazy and congratulating Jan. What you see less of is a substantive analysis of how exactly Jan Apanishi won the candidates. How do you do that? What are the skills that Jan displayed in the 2022 candidates that the other incredibly strong competitors did not display to the same level. And that is the subject of today's video. I've done a lot of work on Jan's incredible candidate's performance, and I'm very excited to share my findings with you. In these next 40, 45 minutes, we are going to delve very deep, as deep as we can possibly delve, into the root causes of Jan Nepomnyshi's victory at the candidate's tournament. Now, I could talk about this for hours, so, I'm going to try to hit on the most important points, and at the end of the video, I hope that you will have a better understanding of what exactly makes Jan Nepomnyshi tick and why he is such an exciting player to watch and why he performs so incredibly well, specifically at the candidates. Now, the first thing that we're going to do is uh, I'm going to present to you some stats that I researched in preparation for the video. So the first thing that I did is I tried to determine at which point in the games Jan did most of the winning. Now he won five games out of 14 and he drew the rest. So the first thing I did was that I ran all of the, the games through an engine and I built a, a little graph. Now this is very amateurish, so please, uh, please forgive the technical quality of this, but I think you'll be able to read the numbers. Uh, I ran each game with an engine and I, uh, sort of made two measurements. The first was the stockfish evaluation after Jan's 15th move. And the second was the stockfish evaluation. And I used stockfish 15, the latest version, at a high depth of 30. Uh, the second measurement was the stockfish evaluation at move 30. So stockfish eval, move 15, stockfish eval, move 30. What I was trying to determine is, you know, were most of Jan's victories really due to the opening and due to an advantage that he accrued in the opening and then extended through the middle game? Or uh, were most of Jan's victories due to his play early in the middle game? Or was it neither? You know, were most of Jan's wins kind of grindy wins that occurred later in the game? Then I was, I told myself, wait a second, before I even get to those stats, I need to determine what the average game length of Jan's games was. And I need to compare it to the other competitors, because that's going to tell us a lot about how Jan's games actually transpired and where most of the winning happened. So without further ado, let's delve into the stats. And here is the bar graph that I built to show uh, the average length of each competitor's participants games. So here you have it. You can see on the on the X axis, the names of the players with Nepo first. This is in order of tournament standings. So Ding is next for Jabba third and so on. And on the Y axis, you see the average game length. So what you should notice that this should immediately jump out at you. Just look at the disparity between Jan's average game length and the game lengths of the rest of the field, the entire rest of the field. 35.1 was Jan's average game length. And you might say, well, that was skewed by a quick draw that he had against Nakamura. Well, not really, because most of the players had at least one relatively quick draw. So that's kind of a non-factor. It was not a fluke caused by one game, but rather almost every one of Jan's games was essentially under 40 moves. Compare that even to the second place finisher, Ding, 48.6. Fabiana Corona, 51.1. Verugia, 50.2. So what does this tell us? What does this mean? Well, this immediately told me two things. The first is something I 
observed as I was commentating the event in Madrid, which is that Jan seems a whole heck of a lot less tired than a lot of the other players. You could see that in the interviews. You could just almost sense it from his body language. And I feel like that should be attributed in large part to simply the fact that his games weren't taking uh, as long of a time. But the second thing that this told me was that Jan was winning most of his games early in the middle game. I mean, some of his games weren't even lasting past 35 moves. And I'm not just talking about draws. I mean, his wins were really, really short. His wins were usually between uh, 30 and 40 moves in length. And then I said, well, okay, but the fact that, let's say, Ding has an average game like the 48.6 won't doesn't necessarily mean that all of Ding's wins were that long. And so what I decided to do then was go back to my initial question, which is, let me look at Jan's move 15 average evaluation and let me compare it to the average evaluation on move 15 of Ding's games. And here's what I found. Let me close this graph and uh, show you this one. And I'd like to uh, give a shout out to Decode. I'll put the uh, link in the description for uh, an excellent website and the ability for a caveman like me to build a decently readable uh, point graph. So what you can see here is the legend indicates the blue dots are the move 15 evaluations of Nepo, the red dots are the move 15 evaluations of Ding. And the way that I constructed this is the ones uh, above the positive values are essentially when uh, either Nepo or Ding were better and the negative values, so minus 0.5, minus one, were when Nepo or Ding were wor worse. And what you should see here shouldn't particularly, th there's nothing that really jumped out at me. What I saw is that almost in every game, uh, the position after move 15 was within the range of equality for both Nepo and Ding. Now you can see a bit of an outlier in round four uh, from Nepo. You can see small outliers on the other end of the coin for Ding. He was slightly worse uh, in round six, for example. But you can also notice that Nepo was quite a bit worse uh, in in the final round. So, uh, so, so there's nothing here that 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 screamed to me that you know the Nepo um, th that Nepo was winning like all of his games in the opening. In fact, I did this comparison for some of the other players. And what I found was largely the same. Nobody won or lost this tournament on the basis of their opening moves. Not a surprise because opening preparation has reached sort of an all time high. But let's transition to the same graph move evaluation after move 30. And here's what we find. Let's close this one and open this one. And let this graph sink in for just a second. Same measurements, same legend. Blue is Nepo, red is Ding. Just look at the disparity in the move 30 stockish evaluations. I mean, this is just crazy. Now, round one, Nepo is facing Ding. So the evaluation is symmetrically good or bad. By move 30, Nepo was essentially delivering checkmate. And, uh, Ding lost a game under 30 moves to Timur Rajabov in round 12. And the way that I indicated that was by giving, giving him an overwhelmingly negative evaluation. You can see round 12, that was against Timur Rajabov. So Nepo doesn't have a single game where the evaluation is below negative three. He's got only one game, only one game out of 14. Just think about that for a second, where he is worse on move 30. And that was the second round game against Fabiana Caruana. And we'll get to that game uh, when we do our sort of main part of the video where we actually analyze uh, the games that allowed Nepo to win the tournament. But this is an amazing measurement because Ding was in second place and he's got a ton of games where he's either slightly worse, he's got two games where he's completely lost or already having resigned by move 30. And he's got a ton of games that are in the range of equality where, whereas Nepo has four or five games that are either completely winning for him, you can see the plus five in round four, uh, and the plus five in round four was against Ali Reza Ferruja. You can see uh, plus 2.5 in round six. So without beating a dead horse, you can see just how unbelievably different uh, Nepo's move 30 graph uh, is to Ding's. And even the games that Ding won, when I investigated them, like the game against Duda, which was essentially equal by move 30, they were long grind out wins in equal or semi-equal end games, whereas Nepo's wins were straight out of the gate. And something happened between move 15 and move 30 in Nepo's games that didn't happen in the same stretch of moves for anybody else in the tournament. 
I produced a bunch of other graphs, a bunch of other comparative graphs, and found much the same thing. This has to do, of course, with average move length, but for every competitor, even their wins mostly didn't occur between move 15 and 30. So we know what we have to do. We have to investigate all five of Nepo's wins and see exactly what is it that he did between move 15 and move 30 that caused so many of his incredibly strong opponents to collapse. And without further ado, let us begin our second part of the investigation. And you could argue that this is the fun part. This is where we actually look at the chess. Okay, let me switch scenes here. There we are. And let's begin with Nepo's round one victory against Dingli Ren. This kicked off the tournament in positive fashion. Now we joined the battle on move 17 and we will not be looking at each game in its entirety. That would be way too long of a video. So we will be looking only at the sort of pertinent and critical stretches, kind of like scientists, you know, trying to figure out the root cause of something. So it's move 17. And in this position, Dingli Ren, who's playing white, plays the move knight a4. So he essentially offers a trade of dark squared bishops, and Nepo spent about 20 minutes in this position deciding whether to trade the bishops or to do something else. And that something else, my guess is, was the bishop sacrifice on h4, trying to get to this relatively weak white king. Because if you look at this position, everything about the white king is safe, except the fact that there's this pawn on h4 that's kind of a hook, which black can attack either with g7, g5, as we'll see later, or with a bishop sack on h4. But I looked at this pretty carefully, and so did Nepo. And my guess is that he found that after takes takes, white has this move f3 to create a little bit of a little bit of luft for the king on f2. And this is a highly inconclusive, wild, chaotic position that just didn't uh, particularly appeal to Jan. And the engine evaluation here at a high depth is approximately equal. White goes queen c3 and builds a pretty scary battery against the g7 pawn. So after a very, very long period of thought, Jan decides to go for the bishop trade. And this leads me to the first sort of very important point about the way that Nepo played in the early middle game. He forced his opponents to make a ton of decisions. So what we'll see in a lot of these games is that Nepo played these moves, which are pretty open-ended. They force his opponent to decide between, you know, sometimes two, sometimes four different candidate moves and the stakes of his opponent's decision always turned out to be high. And his opponents, who recently transitioned from an opening that they were familiar with, just weren't quite capable, weren't quite ready to make decisions of that importance. And watch how quickly Ding collapses when faced with a series of these types of decisions. So the first thing he does after less than two minutes is he takes back with the knight. That looks like a completely reasonable move. I mean, what kind of madman wouldn't take back with a knight and try to get this knight activated through the center? Well, turns out that knight takes b2 is a serious step in the wrong direction. It, it isn't the decisive mistake, but queen takes b2 would have been a lot better. Now, you might ask, well, why on earth is that the case? There's two main reasons. The first is that queen takes b2 already creates a big positional threat, and that is the move b5. Why is b5 dangerous? Well, let's say that black does kind of like what Nepo did in the game, tries to lift the rook to the h file, and then proceed by crashing through with g5. Well, white is already ready to play b5. And after cb5, queen b5, I mean, black's whole position collapses here. The queen x-rays the bishop, attacks b7. And this just looks absolutely terrible. You can't play b6 because you drop the knight on a6. If you play something like rook b8, then white can centralize the rook with rook d1. And there's queen takes b7 now as a threat. So this is not appetizing in the least. So what black would have had to do is drop this knight back to c7 which Nepo ends up doing anyway to stop b5. But this is where the position of the knight on a4 is justified. White can start with a neutral move like rook fd1. But the point is that black now has a very, very hard time lifting the rook to e6 because of this move knight c5 followed by knight takes b7. And the queen on b2 is also well placed because in the event of rook h6, knight b7, g5, black just goes, this is Sparta, tries to crash through. The queen jumps into e5, forking the two minor pieces, and black is not in time to crash through down the h file. So, uh, so this would have been a far more prudent decision, after which I think white is actually slightly better. But instead, Dink takes on b2 with the knight. Nepo patiently guides his knight to the center with knight c7. Dink plays knight c4. That was his entire idea. 
which Nepo parries with the move rookie six. And Ding now kind of realized the, the gravity of the situation. He spent over 10 minutes uh, on his next move. And as it turns out, his situation continues to get worse for the next couple of moves. He plays the move rook ft1, totally sensible. He centralizes the rook, entirely fine. That move is good. But after knight d5, he either underestimated the gravity of the situation or he panicked because he realized that Nepo is actually very, very close to playing the move g5. I mean, he's basically two moves away, rook h6 and g5. And the moment the h file opens, I mean, the situation becomes dire. You could get checkmated here in the span of a couple of moves. And in only 30 seconds, Ding plays an incredibly panicky move. He places rook to d4, which creates an empty threat that's not even a threat and allows Nepo to more carefully prepare the move g5. After rook d4, white is already quite a bit worse. And then after the next move, white is totally lost. Ding had to go b5. He had to crash through on the queen side, create some counterplay. And here the position remains very complex. But after rook d8, or rook d4 rather, Nepo could have played the immediate g5, which was better according to the engine. But instead he quickly plays h6. He wants to prepare g5 with a pawn and recapture it with a pawn and then get his rook to h6. And this is where Ding absolutely panics. He had only one idea that would have saved the game. And this idea is not easy to find. Now it's not bishop takes c4 because of rook takes c4, rook takes c4, and now the knight drops back to f6, attacking the rook twice. Now white doesn't seem to have a problem defending the rook. White can play knight d6. But then Nepo takes on e4. He would have played rook e8, tying the knight down even further. Again, seems like no problem. White plays f3, but loose pieces drop off. And here the brilliant conclusion of the line. Takes on e4, whoop, queen swings to e5, double attack against the rook and the pawn. White's entire kingside collapses. The game is simply over. This might have been what Ding was aiming for initially. We will never know. But the only saving resource would have been actually to double rooks on d1, which sounds like, what are you preparing? And this knight is protected by a pawn. And that's exactly the point. After g5, white can sacrifice the exchange on d5. And it turns out that after white takes on d5, he's got pretty significant compensation for the exchange. If the bishop moves away, then you will not be able to take on h4 because your queen is pinned. But if you play g takes h4, another detail that Ding might have missed, white has the move knight d6, attacking the bishop a second time, essentially forcing black to give the exchange back and leading to a very complicated position that the engine assesses as equal. But yet again, notice that Nepo is putting his opponent in a situation where he has to find these super complex ideas and where he has four or five candidate moves that need to be calculated. At this point, Ding was already in time pressure and he panics completely with the move queen d2. Maybe intending an exchange sacrifice, but Nepo says, hey, I'm not in a hurry to play g5. You have abandoned the e4 pawn so I'm just going to double my rooks on e8. And after king h2, which makes matters even worse, again, Nepo doesn't rush with g5. He improves his bishop, attacking the e2 pawn, gets his rook to f6, attacking the f2 pawn. And after king g1, he finally strikes with g5. And at this point, the attack has reached unstoppable levels. Ding has managed to do absolutely nothing on the queen side. And he finally is attacking b7, which he took. But it is way, way too late to do anything. The exchange stack is also no longer applicable because the queen defends d5. And Nepo went on to finish the attack in excellent fashion in only a couple of moves. So that was Nepo's first win. Now we go to Nepo's second win against Ali Reza Ferrugia. And this was, um, I believe, round four. But I could, uh, let me check that really fast. I should have had this information at hand. Yes, this was round four. So... The opening was a very theoretical Nidorf Sicilian. And this variation of the Nidorf uh, that you see on the board has been around for well over a decade, probably even more than two decades. And for many, many years in this position, uh, black players automatically went a4. This was the move. And it led to this very, very sharp line. White goes knight d4. You don't have to pay much attention to this. This is beyond the scope of the video. But the long story short is that there was a super theoretical position and eventually it started to turn out that white has a bit of an advantage in these positions. New ideas were found, and uh, black has been struggling in this line ever since. So Ali Reza decided to revive the line 
by playing the move bishop e6 to c4, which is probably what you would play if you had been seeing this position for a first time. Now, for a long time, this, this move had been considered uh, dubious because of the response uh, knight g3. But uh, Ali Reza had analyzed this position with uh, some very strong engines, and you, you see this pretty often these days where these lines that had long been considered refuted are now actually getting revived by the strongest new engines. But instead, Nepo, demonstrating stellar preparation, goes king b1, which is also a very popular move and has been played quite a few times in this position. This is still preparation for both players, a4 and knight bc1, which is, of course, the idea of king b1. You're opening up for yourself a square for the knight. Ali Reza, whoops, Ali Reza strikes in the center with the move d5, another typical idea in this line to get this knight out of the incredibly passive e8 square. And now Nepo plays f6, blasting through on the king's side. He only spent two minutes on this move, which tells me that this is still preparation. It's also still preparation for Ali Reza. G takes f6 instantly. This has occurred, by the way, before. G takes f6, and this is the novelty. The previous two or three times that this position had occurred, white played the immediate knight g3. So Nepo takes on f6. It's an incredibly complicated position, and this is where the magic happens. So Nepo plays the move knight g3. And what is so difficult about managing this position for black? First of all, I think it was a bad practical choice for Ali Reza. Just look at the state of black's king. Look at the state of black's pieces. This is not an easy position to play, no matter how how deeply you've analyzed it with an engine. The second thing to, to realize that white's king is incredibly safe. This knight on c1 is a great defender. Black can't just throw everything at white with a move like b3. Because, well, even the simple cb3, ab3, and even a3 is okay here. But a move like bishop h6 is even scarier. If black takes on a2, no problemo at all. The king just tucks itself away on a1. But the problem here is that white has a hidden threat. Well, what is the hidden threat? Let's say that black plays a random move, just to illustrate this. After rook b8, for example, white actually wants to take on c4, trade queens. And you might say, doesn't that counteract the entire idea of the line and aren't we down a pawn? But after bishop takes d8, maybe you can pause the video and quickly figure out what the final move of the sequence is. Well, hopefully you're able to see that the rook on f8 has no squares. White jumps into c5 and simply wins the exchange. So if we rewind for a second, this is a pretty serious threat. And what's incredibly devious about this, that there seems to be a very obvious way to deal with the threat. Well, hmm, if white wants to take on c4, then why don't we just take the bishop on f1 to unburden ourselves from this problem? Now, before we go on, it's important to point out that there is also a second threat with the same idea of trapping this rook. The move I mentioned earlier, bishop h6, is a very, very scary prospect because the rook on f8 is again going to be trapped. So it seems very logical that black can defend against both of these ideas by shifting the king to h8 and opening up an escape square for the rook. That seems totally reasonable. But here's the question. Do you do it before bishop takes f1? Or after bishop takes f1, do you take the bishop first or do you play the immediate king h8? This is a wildly difficult decision, one that Ali Reza spent well over 10 minutes on, over 20 minutes on. He spent something on the order of 25 minutes on his next move. But this is what Nepo was doing all tournament, putting his opponent in a situation where he has to make a difficult decision right out of the opening. If I had to explain Nepo's success in a nutshell, he did that every single game that he won. And Feruja ends up making the wrong choice. The correct move would have been the immediate king h8, the only way to keep the balance. Now, what I think Ali Reza was afraid of, I think he was afraid that Nepo would still end up trading everything on d8, rook d8, rook d8. Uh, and in this position, he would play the move, not rook takes d8, but knight f5, attacking the bishop. The bishop is actually now suddenly in quite a bit of trouble. But if you keep calculating, it turns out that black has the calm bishop d6. And even bishop g5 doesn't do as much as it appears. The bishop drops back to c7. Everything is fine. Black is up a pawn. White's got full compensation in the form of active pieces, but not more than that. The position remains dynamically balanced according to the engine. But back to knight g3. Ali Reza decides, I'm going to take, I'm going to go a3 first with the obvious threat of a takes b3. So Nepo has to respond to that. He plays b3. 
And now I'm going to calmly defend against bishop h6 with the move king h8. Now that looks completely fine in practice, uh, in, in principle, but not in practice. Because the one thing that I think Ali Reza kind of underestimated is that Nepo can now take the pawn on d5. And the whole idea of this pawn sacrifice in the first place is to free up a very nice square for the knight, which is exactly what Ali Reza does. He plays the move knight d6. And this turns out actually to be the decisive mistake. Black's position is already very, very bad. The only way to keep chances alive would have been to shift the queen to c7. But here, white has the incredibly strong exchange sacrifice, rook takes f6. You can analyze this on your own. Ali Reza plays knight d6. And Nepo, he thinks for a bit, he thinks for right about three minutes, and he says, Ali Reza, thank you very much for your main pawn, the b4 pawn, which is one of Black's main attackers because it protects the c3 pawn. Ali Reza must have relied on the fact that there will be a discovered attack against the queen. But there isn't a discovered attack against the queen. There isn't even anything remotely dangerous that black can do. Knight e4, no problem at all. Let me throw this pawn onto d6. Bishop d6, rook d6, and black's position collapses. Knight d6, bishop g5 with a devastating pin. Okay, what else can black try? Knight f5, same exact thing. White plays d6, and even the simple queen e1 leads to a winning position. This is a complete paper tiger, which Ali Reza had clearly failed to notice. But it doesn't stop there. Ali Reza plays rook c8 to prepare the move knight c4. He tries to make something out of nothing. And Nepo has a lot of ways to keep the advantage. But the second thing he did was unbelievable precision in this stretch from move 15 to move 30. He generally found the correct move every time that there was a, a move that led to a very significant evaluation and there was a drop off between the first best move and the second best move, Nepo almost always found the top move. He notices that the pawn on e5 is actually a very big weakness. Now, you won't think of it that way, or who cares about that pawn? And how does white even attack it? Well, here's how. Bishop b6, attacking the queen, and queen b4 to e1, played in 45 seconds, no less, attacking the pawn on e5, and you can't defend it. You can't defend the pawn. The only thing you can do is play e4. But that yields the devastating long diagonal after bishop d4, black can resign. In fact, black can already resign here because this attack on the pawn, coupled with the fact that black's king is unbelievably weak, leads to a totally losing position. Feruja played rook b8. Nepo calmly brings the bishop back to a5. And the only way that Feruja found to defend the pawn is knight c4, right, using the pin. But what does that do? Well, we already know that anytime you move the knight away from d6, White has the possibility of ripping open everything with the move d6. Nepo plays it without hesitation. After bishop d8, bishop c3, the game is essentially over. The knight comes out to d3. And after knight d5, Nepo finishes things up with knight f4, forcing the exchange of knights and using the pin, a very elegant move. And the game lasted uh, only seven more moves. Black's position is completely in shambles. And uh, the game is essentially over. So once again, the MO in this game was to force Ali Reza to make a difficult decision immediately out of the opening. Now we go to our third victory against Jan Shistov Duda, against Jan Shistov Duda in round six. So Nepo in this game decided to play a King's Indian attack. And it led to a very unbalanced position with two bishops for each side. So this is the position on the board um, after Duda's 14th move. Now, a lot of people here would say, okay, well, the pawn on e5 is kind of a weakness. It's not hanging, right? It's not technically hanging because the bishop on c5 is going to be hanging in return. Uh, but I think a lot of people play with like bishop c3 here. Let, let, me, let me protect this pawn just in case. The problem here is that black will go rook a d8. And let's not forget that black is a pretty impressive pawn center, which he can use to shove this d pawn down the board. And neither of white's bishops is particularly impressive. Uh, where they sit. So Nepo decides that his biggest advantage lies in exploiting his kingside pawn majority, and that's exactly what he does. He plays the move g4, using some small tactics. If queen takes e5 check, he covers with tempo and wins one of the bishops. And after bishop g6, Nepo fearlessly advances his f pawn to f4, threatening the move f5. Now, this is not the point at which Duda has a big decision to make. At this point, Black's move is pretty clear. He's got to create some luft. Now Nepo spends about 20 minutes. And I love that he does this because he did it at strategic moments throughout the tournament. He's a pretty fast player, but he still spent time when he had, when he had to. Now there's no doubt in my mind that he was considering the move f5 
very seriously. And perhaps you're wondering why you wouldn't play that move. Well, the problem is that after bishop h7, bishop f4, you got to defend the pawn. Yes, the black bishop is very poorly placed at the moment, but so is the pawn on e5. And black can shift the bishop around to c7 and attack this pawn with everything that he's got, the rook, the bishop, the queen, and white is going to have a very, very hard time defending that pawn. If you say, all right, I'm going to bring my queen over to defend it, well, after queen g3, g5 is a very strong move here, by the way, but even after rook a8, white is defenseless against the threat of bishop takes e5. And besides, f5 would basically force black to find the correct moves. Instead, look at what Nepo does. He plays the move queen to e1. Now, the intention of this move is pretty clear. He's trying to get his queen to g3. But why is he doing that? Well, that's exactly what tripped Duda up. Duda plays rook f8, piling up on the e5 pawn, discouraging f5. Nepo goes queen g3. And it is at this point that black has a huge decision to make. And it actually doesn't seem like black has such a big decision to make. It seems pretty obvious what, white, what black should do. Well, if Nepo brought his queen to g3, reasons Duda. That means he wants to play f5 and maybe even f6. That's not something that I could allow. So here's what I'm going to do, says Duda. I'm going to bring this bishop back to h7 preliminarily, which is a very smart looking idea because if white plays f5, well, you still can't take on e5 because you're going to drop the bishop as we discussed. But what you can do is play bishop to d4, forking the b2 and e5 pawns. Less important is the fact that black attacks this pawn. More important is the fact that white cannot defend e5. And Duda thought that he had everything covered. But it turns out that Nepo had tricked him. And Nepo's idea was never actually to play f5, or it was, but that wasn't his main idea. His main idea was to play h4. Okay, well, what h4, why h4? What is he trying to do? Well, what he's trying to do is actually push the pawn up to g5, not to f5, in order to shatter black's king position. Duda, totally oblivious to that, goes rook a d8. He thinks he's out of the woods. He thinks he's totally out of the woods. But suddenly Nepo advances not the f pawn, as I still think Duda was expecting this, but the g pawn, g4, g5. And the whole point is that if black keeps the king side dried up with h5, now white plays f5. Now white plays f5. And if you play bishop d4, much like in the game, the pawns overwhelm the black pieces. e6, f takes e6, and g6 simply traps the bishop on h7. So once again, Nepo was forcing his opponent to make a decision, but without Duda even realizing that there was a decision to be made. And the decision to be made is how do we discourage the move g5? There was a hidden threat that Nepo had made. He had lulled Duda into a sense of security, into thinking, hey, I've stopped white from playing f5, I'm safe on the king side. And so Duda makes a general improving move, forgetting that Nepo's idea is actually to first play g5 and then to play f5. In fact, there was only one way, only one reliable way to take the sting out of the move h5. You had to play bishop d4. And the point is that if white plays g5, you don't take the pawn on b2, that would be way too greedy on account of g takes h6 but you simply play h5. And bishop d4 is a prophylactic move. Now white can't play f5 because of bishop takes c5 and you don't have the time to go g6. So after bishop d4, most likely Nepo would have gone bishop c3. Now you trade bishops. And now once again, it is critically important for black to put a stop to white's kingside pressure and play the fearless g7, g5. Not an easy move to make, but the only move which leads to full-fledged dynamic equality. The position remains incredibly sharp, but black can actually try to turn the king side around to his favor with the move king g7 followed by rook h8. And it turns out that white's king is actually not out of the woods. But Duda didn't find that. And instead he played the move rook a d8. And Nepo, once again, as I said in the previous game, anytime he had the opportunity to act precisely in order to gain an advantage, he did that. He almost never missed those opportunities where the top engine move there was a big difference in the top engine move and the second engine move, and he plays perfectly in the next stretch. He goes g5. Duda has nothing better to do than to take on g5, but now he has sprung a leak. And not only has he sprung a leak, but after bishop b4, Nepo trades and plays f5. And once again, the threat of g6 gives f5 new life. And Duda saw nothing better than to give away the bishop. He takes on b2. He gets a bunch of pawns for it. That's true. But he loses the bishop in the middle game. And that was not a loss that he, uh, that he could survive. 
Now, this was maybe the last chance for Duda to gain serious drawing chances. He had to take this pawn, which is not an easy thing to do, putting the king in harm's way. The point is that after rook b1, you drop the queen back to e5 and you force the queen trade. Instead, Duda kind of automatically played king h8 in less than two minutes. And after rook b1, it turns out that you don't have the time to go queen e5 anymore because after rook takes b7, you're going to have to waste a move to take this pawn on h7, right? You're going to have to take it eventually or white's going to defend it and it's going to win the game. So with queen e5 out of the question, Duda has to keep the queens on the board. But the side with the extra minor piece obviously favors in that, uh, in that event. And Nepo ends up winning this game pretty smoothly in only seven more moves. Duda had a couple of chances, but after Rook takes f5, another brilliant tactic you can't take because you get mated. The White King is perfectly safe, surrounded as it is by this cocoon of pieces, which are also attacking. Then he brings the Rook to f7, threatening Rook f8 check. He covers the check by Duda. And then all of a sudden he swings the Rook to g5. And the pressure on g7 has gotten totally unbearable. And at the end of the game, What's ironic is that Duda never managed, never managed to capture the pawn on h7, and it actually ends up winning the game. Without that pawn, White's attack would have still been devastating, but not quite as devastating. On the next move, Nepo's going to take on g7, go rook g8, and Duda, uh, with almost no time left on his clock, resigned the game. Now, game four was a particularly, uh, win number four, I apologize, was a particularly fascinating game. This was round seven. And what's fascinating about it is that... Uh, I think the reason for Nepo's win was largely overlooked by, by the commentators um, and, and by people analyzing the game. They played a Petrov, and Nepo has been playing the Petrov pretty much exclusively uh, starting from his first world championship match against Magnus. Now, they reached a position which is incredibly popular, and uh, there's a lot of popular moves in this position. C takes d5, knight c3, rook e1. And Richard Report decides to make an exceedingly rare move, which has approximately 15 games in the database. He plays queen to b3. And even by the standards of these top GMs, a move like queen b3, I would not bat an eye if Nepo didn't remember his analysis or even didn't know the move. But he did. And not only did he know the move, but he responds with an even more rare continuation. The main move in this position, this has been played by Grandmasters, knight a6. But I looked at this carefully, and I think this is what Richard Report was hoping for. After knight c3, white gets a very pleasant position. I feel like these structures are always in white's favor. Plus, the knight on a6 is a little bit awkward. The engine, it gives white a pretty stable edge. Instead, Nepo fearlessly brings his bishop out to g4, sacrificing the pawn on b7 and aiming for a rapid-fire kingside attack. He wants to take this knight out of the equation and... On queen takes b7, he would have done just that. This is unthinkable because after gf, uh, queen h4, the attack uh, grows totally unbearable. But Report knew this as well. And Richard Report keeps blitzing out moves. He takes the knight. He brings the knight to g5. Nepo blitzes out moves as well. Bishop back to e7, opening up the attack on d4. They both take each other's center pawns. And Richard Report finally takes on b7 of the queen. They're still blitzing out these moves. Now, the craziest thing about this, this position occurred for the first time in 1928. That's how long it's been known. In a correspondence game, to be fair, where black was the Czech, uh, Czech Republic, Czechoslovakia correspondence champion. And after queen takes e4, queen takes a8, modern computers immediately give the move that Nepo played. But the Czech correspondence champion actually made a completely viable move as well. And a move later, he demonstrated the idea that Nepo uses in on this move. That game continued bishop d6, queen takes a7, and now bishop g4 to h3. And the point is that after g takes h3, he swings the queen up to e5. This was 1928, and no computers, no nothing, just you had the time to think about it because it was a correspondence game. And the point is that after f4, black delivers the intermezzo, and then another intermezzo, and it's either checkmate or black wins the queen. So white has to allow queen takes h2. The position is incredibly complicated, and I don't think that white is even better here either. But Nepo decides to go for the immediate draw. Bishop h3 straight away. G takes h3, and now a repetition of moves. Check, check. Check, check. Now Richard Report goes for it. He plays f3, which is fine. Now queen d3. And this is the moment at which Report goes crazy. Now, the civilized move... King g2, queen g6, king h1, queen d3. You have no way to defend the rook. 
you have to go king g2. Or wait a second, do you? And that's what Rapport thought. He said, no, 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 no. I don't have to go for the draw. I can defend my rook with my knight. And it's not that he missed Nepo's next move, which is queen d7. The queen suddenly swings back to d7, preparing the unstoppable knight a6, which will trap white's queen and force white to give that queen away for Nepo's second rook. Now, it's not that Rapport didn't see that. He obviously saw that, but by his own admission, he completely misevaluated the resulting position. The resulting position, which happens after knight e4, knight a6, queen f8, bishop f8, is actually much, much better for black, borderline winning. And I feel like a lot of commentators um, and, and people looking at this game were just like, what is Rapport thinking? It's obvious that black is much better here. Well, it's actually not that obvious that black is much better here. The, the reason isn't anything having to do with material. White is up material. Count it. White has two rooks and a pawn for the queen. So from a material standpoint, Rapport's decision makes a lot of sense. It doesn't make a lot of sense from the perspective of king safety. White's king is going to be permanently unsafe. The second thing to note is that white is going to lose one of the pawns back. The h3 pawn is a sitting duck. If you push it, then you allow something even worse to happen. The queen jumps into d4, and you're going to end up losing a much more valuable pawn. So Report decided to go for the lesser evil, and he gave up the h3 pawn in order to bring his pieces into the game. Nepo makes some lift with h6, and after bishop g3, once again, a moment has, ar has arisen where in order to solidify a big advantage, Yanni Pamishi has to find the best move. The second best move is not nearly as good. And yet again, he does. He plays knight a6 to c5, essentially forcing white either to trade knights or to allow black's knight to jump into the game by retreating to e6 and then advancing toward the king side, either to f4 or to g5. Now, Richard probably should have traded knights here, but this position is terrible. White can't move. The pawn on f3 is incredibly weak. Black has a simple idea of advancing the h pawn and dislodging the bishop, which means that this rook is basically paralyzed. And this is, you know, I would avoid this with a 10-foot pole. This was Richard Report's uh, lesser evil. But the funny thing is, if you rewind, rook fe1 actually, or bishop g3 rather, was the big mistake. It was the decisive mistake, in my opinion. He had to play the relatively inhuman move a3. And now that I've shown you this line, I hope you you're able to figure out why a3 is required. It's required because white needs to get rid of this bishop. b4 forces the bishop off the diagonal. After bishop d4, you drop the bishop back to g3. And black's bishop is a lot less stable on d4. Well, it's hanging, it's defended indirectly, but eventually white will be able to move the f rook away and force the bishop off of this diagonal, giving white a little bit more freedom from his pieces, uh, for his pieces. But all of that is a bit of a moot point because Nepo is already much better. After rook fe1, he again correctly brings the knight back to e6 and advances the pawn to h5. Later, he brought it to h4, and white's position is getting shattered. The knight is jumping into f4, and Richard Report defended. He defended resiliently, but in 10 more moves, it was game over. And look, look at how Nepo uses his knight to hit Report where it hurts, attacking f3, attacking e4. The queen and knight combo is the most dangerous tandem in all of chess, and Nepo illustrated that with this win. Now you might ask, well, what was the reason behind this win? Did he get a little bit fortunate? Absolutely. He got fortunate in that Richard Report decided to test him on a line uh, that he knew. But last time I checked, that's not luck. That's diligence. That's incredibly good preparation. That's a good job expecting surprises and leaving no stone unturned, looking at a very rare move and not just settling for what people had played previously, but actually looking with a very strong engine and finding Bishop G4. And what did I say earlier? Every game that Napo won was at least partially due to a situation in which he forced his opponent to make inconvenient decisions. Well, where was that inconvenient decision here? Well, it was that very decision report made to decline the draw. Because think of it, he's playing with the white pieces. Nepo at this point is leading the tournament. Richard Report wants to be the hero. He doesn't want to admit that his preparation has failed. And he wants to make Nepo work. He wants to give himself a chance. And those considerations make it a lot more likely that you will look at a certain position with rose-colored glasses. He'll say, well, I've got two rooks for the queen. My king is okay. It's defended by a bunch of pieces. And a superficial assessment of the position. Report only spent two minutes, uh, three minutes or so, on knight d2 itself. All of that stems from the fact that Nepo put him in that position where, hey, you know, that demon is calling your name, right? You can go for the win here. It's not too much risk. You've got two rooks. 
Once again, Report makes the wrong decision and loses the game. And the final victory was uh, a game that is now very famous against Ali Reza Farouja in round 11. That was followed by three draws, clinching the tournament. And in round 11, Ali Reza, the night before, he had played a bullet match very irresponsibly against someone who shall go unnamed. But once again, it was a Petrov. Nepo has the black pieces, so we'll flip the board. And uh, I don't think I flipped the board in the last game, but that's okay. So the following position occurs once again after Ali Reza's 15th move. He goes king h1. Nepo brings his rook into the game with rook a c8. That's a prophylactic move. It's a very astute one. And it's prophylaxis against f4, which would be a very nasty move. You don't want to bring your knight back to g6. That knight is very, very, very poorly positioned. Instead, you want to go knight c4. And if white continues tossing the knight around with b3, you, sh you jump into e3. Little tactics. Little tactics. Rook takes c3. And after bishop f2, the position is tremendously complex. I let the engine sit here. It's giving a tiny minuscule edge for white. This knight on d4 is very nicely placed, but conversely, the pawn on d5 is a major weakness. So this is what Ali Reza should have gone for. But looking at this position, it's not easy to determine that white is not worse in the position after knight e3. And yet again, did Nepo know that Ali Reza had the bullet session the night before, was probably tired? No, probably he didn't. But he reached a position in which all of the pieces are still on the board, and he knows that Ali Reza is having a bad tournament. And so in a situation like this, he knows that Ali Reza is likely to make a hasty or otherwise extreme, rash, impulsive decision. And that's exactly what Ali Reza does. In this highly complicated position, Ali Reza spends a little bit over 10 minutes and plays g2, g4, trying to catch Nepo off guard and shove this pawn down to g5. Nepo doesn't take very long to say, no, 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 you're not doing that. He goes h6. Ali Reza insists he plays h4. And yet again, I've traced two patterns that have been responsible for Nepo's wins in the early middle game. The first, forcing his opponent to make inconvenient decisions. But the second, almost always reacting correctly when the difference between the first move and the second was big. And that is the case for Nepo's next couple of moves. He plays the calm rook f8, preparing... This rook is going to be a very, very important piece. Ali Reza continues with his plan. Takes, takes. Knight f6 to h5, fearlessly dragging the knight to the rim because it's got access to the g3 scar. Ali Reza had been aiming for this position after king g2. If you look at it carefully, you might say, well, white is threatening to play f4, attacking both knights at the same time. There isn't much the black can do about that. I think a lot of people would be tempted to play g6 here. But after f4, knight c4, white takes on h5 anyway. And how the heck do we evaluate this position? White can't take on h5, but you know, white can play a bunch of different moves. Even knight e6 is a very interesting idea, followed by queen takes h5. Black's king is in a lot of trouble here, and the position remains very, very complex. So a lot of people would do that. A lot of people would probably jump to c4 immediately and then transpose into that line, but not Jan Nepomnishy. He takes 10 minutes and he finds yet again the most accurate move, knight e5 to g6, preparing a brilliant knight sacrifice. Ali Reza has no choice but to play f4, otherwise black's knight jumps into f4 with disastrous effects. But knight takes f4 is a sacrifice that I'm hoping you remember and is seared into your memory because this is the candidate's winning sequence. Queen takes b2, bang, striking at the queen tide. All of white's pieces are collapsing. Knight is hanging, bishop is hanging, king is weak. Ali Reza, despite resilient defense, is unable to keep himself in the game. Rook c4, another brilliant move, attacking the knight on d4, using the pin. And uh, bishop takes g5, queen side, king side, queen side, king side, strike, 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 bishop takes g5. If you take with a knight, then you give up e3. And if you take with a bishop, then you give up e4, and then d4 is going to fall because you can't move the knight. The other bishop hangs. All of Ali Reza's minor pieces are in trouble. And I can analyze this for another 20 minutes. Rook takes d4 is another brilliant move. But the upshot is that on the heels of 10 or 15 accurate moves, Nepo reached an endgame, which practically speaking is completely winning. Black's got four passed pawns. White's king is still incredibly weak. And white's pieces are scattered all around the board. Nepo, uh, Ferruja rather, could have still defended if he was an engine. But sometimes he is. But... Most of the time, he's not, and it didn't take Nepo very long. First, to trap the knight, drag the rook into the game with rookie three, threatening bishop h3. And I'm going very quickly here because this is outside the scope 
of what we're talking about. This is already move 34. The game does not last past move 35. Bishop b4 check is crushing because either Ali Reza gets checkmated or he allows bishop takes d5 with a fork against the rook and the knight. And Nepo finished the game with a lot of time. And those, ladies and gentlemen, were Nepo's five victories in the candidates. The rest of the games ended in draws. He was only flat out losing, well, one and a half times against Fabiano Caruana in round two. But the position was incredibly complex. And then against Ikaru Nakamura, where the position was also incredibly complex. And finding the winning path involved something that Nepo had been doing a lot more consistently than his opponents. Finding the correct move in critical moments. In moments where if you didn't find the correct move, the evaluation dropped precipitously. Everybody in this tournament and the candidates were, were, was able to find good moves a lot of the time. Nepo was the only one who found those good moves with incredible consistency in the early middle game. That is where he won all five of his games in between moves 15 and 30. And in conclusion, let's go back for a second to our graphic, our move 30 graphic. Just look at the difference between Nepo and Ding, the second place finisher. You can imagine how much more drastic this graph looks when you compare Nepo to the other player. So both in terms of game length and in terms of this measurement, we can see that where Nepo's greatest strength lay this tournament was in his ability to win the game early in the middle game. His opponent had just transitioned from the opening and was still somewhat unprepared to make big decisions. Nepo forced his opponents to make big decisions. And then when he was confronted with big decisions himself, he almost always made the right one and responded very, very accurately to his opponent's biggest mistakes. Now, there's a lot more to talk about. I could make 10 videos on Nepo's candidate's performance. And I know that a lot of this analysis was a little bit rushed, but I'm hoping that this gives you a somewhat better sense. I'm getting this question a lot on stream. You know, why does one Super GM win a tournament over another? How does that happen? I'm hoping that I was able to shine at least a very dim light on that question. I hope you enjoyed the stats and the analysis. I'd like to thank you for watching the video. This was a long one, but I had a ton of fun talking about Nepo. I'd like to congratulate him one more time and wish him the very best of luck in his match against Ding Li Ren. But for now, thank you for watching. Please feel free to leave questions in the comments as usual, and I will see you in the next video.